like this. Is it better? So I think that uh, anyone uh, who ever read a paper about Peter Spinner families is curious about, uh, about the origin of the problems. Like basically trying to understand some the, what's, the, what's this underlying gauge theory or what's the word line or word sheet action that's behind the Peter Spinner BRST chart. So I'll try to, to, to give a, a summary of these two papers. And I, I don't think the, the, the subject is closed. I don't think this is the final answer, but I think it's at least a step forward to, to in this direction. And so this is a brief outline. So I'll mostly discuss the super particle. I think it's, it's more accessible for these 30 minutes. And then later I will uh, do the generalization for the, for the worksheet. So I will basically, we start with a re review of the super particle. Then I'll, I'll discuss this twister-like constraint that Nathan proposed as a solution for the, or as, as one of the fundamental gauge schemes behind the formulas. I'll discuss his proposal. What's, what's good about it and what, what's not uh, well, completely correct. And then uh, I will propose this extension, explain the, the, the fundamental gauge symmetries behind. But it's, it's supposed to be very accessible. There's nothing fancy, just basically uh, BR, st BR state construction or even a bit of BV formalis, but it's, it's very straightforward. So let me start with the super particle. So I think every, everybody here knows the, the, super, the Brink Schwartz action. So it's basically the, the, the space time generalization of this word line particle. It has this very simple form in, the, in this first order formula. So you have here the, this P square as the generator of uh, word line translations, or you can think of it as the Hamiltonian. E is the Einbein. Again, you can think of it as a, just a Lagrange multiplier imposing this constraint. And then you have P and theta. Theta is the super partner of this target space coordinate X. P is the conjugate. And you have here this other Lagrange multiplier, chi alpha, uh, imposing this other constraint, the alpha equals P alpha minus P. So this is uh, connected to kappa symmetry. And this other Lagrange multiplier is the representation symmetry. As you probably know, this the alpha, uh, only half of it is, uh, is first class. So it's one of the difficulties in, con in, con in quantizing this, this particle uh, in a covariant way. Uh, but uh, what I wanted to get from here is just the simple form of this action. So you can compare it with the pure spinner action, is, is this one. Right? So this action was introduced by, by Berkowitz in 2001 after his uh, superstring paper. And for example, here you don't see uh, anymore the, the Einbein. So you can think of it as a, as a gauge fixed form of that uh, action, although, although at, the, at this time it wasn't known how the, the, the representation symmetry played any role in this formalism. And I have here the same uh, conjugate pair for the super particle. And you have here these ghost variables, the, the pure spinner variable lambda it satisfies this constraint here. Right? And the BRST charge has this very simple form. So there's nothing. Uh, about uh, representation again, there is this lambda alpha d alpha. So you're basically picking some of the components of, the, uh, of, of this d alpha as the gauge generators. And the new potents of the BRST, the BRST charge follows from the pure spinner constraint. Right? So physical states are, are very simple. They're defined in this ghost number one cohomology. And if you consider any wave function of this form, BRST closed the will imply this equation. And this is the alpha is just a, a realization of this uh, super derivative. And together with the pure spinner constraint, we get this equation of motion, which is the, the linearized uh, equation of motion for super young mu's, right? So A alpha is a super field. OK, so the question is, what is behind? What are the gauge symmetries uh, leading to this BRST charge? You can think of it as the kappa symmetry, but it's not quite because if you go back, uh, I told you that only half of this d alpha are first class constraints. And this pin, pure spinner lambda, because of this constraint, instead of this uh, 16 components that you'd have in 10 dimensions, it has only 11 independent components. Right? So there's, there's something more than the, the kappa symmetry, not, not exactly representation invariance. So these are the things that we're trying to understand. Right? 
So in this direction, Nathan proposed uh, this uh, twister-like constraint here. Right? So uh, the idea is to like to try to understand what's uh, what's the gauge symmetry that leads to the, to that specific farm or that the very specific BRST charge, and uh, to understand other uh, more fundamental things. For example, like what was the word line representation, or or in the case of the word sheet, where is the where, are the, where is the, the worksheet metric, how do you fix it, and things like that. And one of the, the like, simple observations that the PRST and BSC charge is uh, linear in the, in the momentum, like this PM. And uh, usually the generators of uh, reparameterization, they are quadratic. Right? So what Nathan proposed is this uh, twister-like constraint. In fact, this, this twister-like constraint is, is very old. It's, it appeared in papers uh, at the end of the 80s, papers of Sorokin and uh, other authors. But uh, I think the only new ingredient that Nathan introduced is the, this lambda is a projective pure spinner. So instead of, uh, oh, instead, in addition to satisfying this pure spinner constraint, lambda gamma m lambda equals zero, it has this kind of equivalent. So you can, uh, multiplied by any scaling, and and the theory remains the same. So you can think of this as a uh, scaling uh, gauge symmetry, right? And the important feature here is that lambda is not a ghost variable, right? So lambda before in the gauge in the in the pure spin reaction was a ghost variable, and here is like a, an ordinary matter variable. Right? And what's the interpretation of this constraint? Basically, if you impose this equals zero, you're automatically implying the, the p square equals zero uh, constraint. So you can think then that uh, if you impose this as a gauge symmetry, reparameterization symmetry is just a consequence, right? So it's kind of redundant symmetry. Okay, physical interpretation is, is, is more or less simple. So you, if you look at this, uh, like, let's take, uh, D equals to N dimensions, and you complexify it, any, any uh, solution for this uh, P square equals zero, you can put in this form. Basically, if you count the number of parameters, you can see that uh, these massless solutions can be put in this form for this dynamical gamma. And basically, if you, if you impose this, this uh, the, the, if you decompose PM in these uh, two UN variables, PA and P bar A, you can uh, build this constraint, and it implies p square equals zero if gamma a b is anti-symmetric in the two indices. Right? An interpretation of this gamma a b as, the, as exactly uh, the components of these project, projective pure spinners, and they are known to parameterize this coset. Like uh, you can see papers from Microsoft uh, explaining better this, this connection to, to projective pure spinners and the parameterization of this, this coset. And in fact, if you, if you, if you decompose the, the components of, of this constraint in terms of these UN variables, you see that these are exactly the, the independent uh, constraints or the independent components of that constraint. So in order to incorporate this, these features in our world line action, what Nathan proposed is this, this action here. So you see there is no uh, p squared term with, uh, with the Einbein. It's because this, uh, basically you can write this EPM, PM as PM uh, lambda gamma M alpha over lambda lambda. Right, so this is the twister-like constraint, and you can write p square in this form. Right, so what do you do here? So instead of adding this term to the to the Lagrangian, you can just absorb it by a shift of this lambda alpha, right? Because lambda alpha is basically the object multiplying this this constraint. So if you shift lambda alpha by this con by this quantity, this p square is removed from the reaction. Right, so th in this sense. Uh, uh, the p square or the representation symmetry is redundant, right? 
Uh, of course, I'm introducing this lambda. I want my theory to be Lorentz covariant, so I'm making it dynamical. So I'm adding here this uh, kinetic term. The projective condition that I mentioned before is, is implemented to the scaling symmetry. So lambda alpha W alpha generates the scalings of, of lambda and W, and I'm introducing it as this Lagrange multiplier with this A field. Lambda, uh, this L alpha is the Lagrange multiplier of the, of the pure spinner of the twister like constraint. And as, a, as I mentioned here, the Einbein's effect is absorbed by this L alpha. Okay? And this is important because you have to take into, uh, this into account when you're gauge fixing the theory. Because, of course, E or the Einbein has the interpretation of the world line metric. So you cannot fix, for example, L alpha to zero. Right? If you fix it to zero, it's like fixing uh, e equals zero, and you're, it's like a singular gauge choice. Basically, you, you don't fix all, all your gauge degrees of freedom by, by this choice. So what do I have here? So this is the action again. Uh, because of this constraint, lambda gamma and lambda equals zero, the action has these extra gauge symmetries. But they, are, they, they kind of play a special role. They are not to, to be gauge fixed. So there is this redu redundancy of, of these operators. For example, this one is very simple to understand. If you, if you change uh, L alpha by any function times lambda alpha, this will automatically vanish, right? So it's uh, one of these uh, pure spinner gauge symmetries. But uh, I think the better way to understand that is, is that if you go to the BV formalism, these uh, gauge symmetries, they appear as, as constraints on the anti-fields. So it's a better way to, to deal with it. Because if you try to gauge fix this, you end up finding that, that there's an infinite uh, tower of gauge for gauge transformation that you have to fix, and, and it doesn't take you any, anywhere uh, interesting, let's say. So these are the gauge symmetries of the action. So C is parameterizing reparameterization, as I said. It's there. And theta is parameterizing this twister-like symmetry. Uh, OK. So as expected, C is a redundant gauge symmetry. And to see this, you can consider this gauge for gauge transformations. Right? So let's take, for example, the, the first one. This dx equals C x dot plus lambda gamma n theta. Right? So if you do this gauge for gauge transformations here, and here, what you get is changing phi uh, c to phi, and this theta here to l and minus. Right? So basically, if I, if I do this gauge for gauge transformation in the in the gauge transformation for for, c, for x here, I'll get this this. Uh, let's say, this is the gauge for gauge transformation of the gauge transformation. <laughs> yeah? And you get this, and this is exactly the equation of motion for p, right? So you can do to this to all the other symmetries, and you see that this is, like, uh, in fact, a, a redundant symmetry. So there's this simple gauge for gauge transformation that can get can 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 get rid of this c parameter, right? So this is a way to to understand why reparameterization symmetry doesn't appear there at the, at the final result. It's contained in the in the twister-like gauge symmetry. So in addition, this uh, ghost variable, this theta alpha, or the parameter of the gauge transformations, is uh, defined up to these pure spinner shifts. And this is a, exactly a consequence of, of this relation here. Right? So the Lagrange multiplier has this gauge freedom, and so does the, the ghost field associated. Right? So you can use the symmetries to fix a equals zero. So to fix A equals zero, I'm just using the, the scaling symmetry here with this parameter omega. So there's a derivative, so it will give me some dynamical ghost. L alpha equals to this. So C is just a, an ordinary uh, constant vector. But the point is that if, if you fix L alpha to this, it's equivalent to fix E equals one. So this is the ordinary gauge fixing of the, of the massless particle. And C equals zero is a gauge for gauge fixing because of this parameter. Because there is no derivative on phi, this gauge fixing here will generate no, no dynamical ghost for ghost. 
And at the end, you get this action with this BRST charge. Right? It's not exactly the, the pure spinner BRST charge, and there are a couple of reasons for that. First, because of these uh, constraints on the, on the ghost, the conjugate of theta is also constrained to satisfy this relation, so this model, after all, is not uh, super symmetric. Right? So this is one of the problems of, of, of uh, Nathan's proposal, is that uh, he didn't completely consider the, this uh, gauge invariance on the, on the ghost. Right, so the final result is not super symmetric. So this, this model cannot really this model cannot really describe the, the pure spinner super particle. But it has some nice features. So if you look at it uh like this uh these three points that are very interesting. Lambda is not a ghost variable, it enters the formula as a as a, as a matter variable. It explains the the role of uh reparameterization and ideally uh, space-time supersymmetry is an emergent feature, meaning that uh, it will come from these ghosts, right? From the two-select ghosts. The point is that uh, there was this incorrect account, so this, th that model cannot really be uh, space-time supersymmetric. Uh, this one requires a word-line scalar ghost. It means that uh, the pure spinner superparticle lambda is a ghost variable, right? And theta is a matter variable. So in order to, to make this, this flip, like between ghost number uh, of, of lambda and theta, I need some, some other field, some kind of ghost field. And this is a nice ingredient that will be incorporated. And another thing that uh, was incomplete before is that the gauge fixing that Nathan proposed is this one, L alpha equals zero, and it's, uh, it kind of implies E equals zero. So it's a singular gauge fixing. So what I propose in, the, in, the, in this uh, paper of the particle is a generalization of this action, basically to correct these three points. So this incorrect account of the pure spinner symmetries, basically you can uh, extend the phase space. So as I told you, the, uh, this, this ghost, theta alpha associated to the, to the two-select symmetry has some, some uh, implied gauge invariance because of the pure spinner constraints. So at the end, instead of these 16 components, only five components are, are, are independent, right? So you have to supplement your model somehow with 11 components. And the way to do this is to extend the phase space with extra spinners and they have to be constrained, right? Because if you put 16 more, it won't match it then. The word this uh, word line scalar ghost what I add is the, like a fermionic symmetry. It looks a bit like word line supersymmetry, but it's not quite. And this idea is motivated by this uh, paper of uh, Sorokin et al. in 88 about this super embedding formulation of, of the particle. And the singular gauge fixing, as I said, it was, it was solved by recognizing that lambda at this L alpha, the Lagrange multiplier, incorporates also the, the word line metric, right? So it's a very simple extension of, of Bregovic's model, which, which is in black, you add only these two pieces, right? So this extra two pieces, it's a, it's a new spinner. As I said, it's constrained, right? Uh, to satisfy this condition. So this takes care of this uh, con uh, extra, extra components and you impose another symmetry with this Lagrange like, multiplier chi generated by lambda alpha p alpha. If, if you look at this equation, it looks like if you take these two terms, it looks a lot like word line supersymmetry, but again, it's not, it's not quite it. Okay. Uh, so this still lacks some, some better physical interpretation. But the point is that if you consider this model, you have this uh, these gauge transformations we have their reparameterization, the, the symmetry generated by the tester like constraint, scaling is there, but also you have now this, these two symmetries, uh, this extra symmetry generated by, by lambda alpha p alpha. So it's kind of a super symmetry uh, of the word line. This one here appears, this is the, the Lagrangian multiplier, and so on. And of course, this, this pure spinner symmetry that we had before, they have to be extended to this bigger phase space. Right? So what we had before was just the M, F, and FMN, and now we have these other two plus these other components. 
right? And all these, all of these gauge symbols, uh, pure spinner symbols, they have to be taken into account because they will appear later as as constraint on the on the anti fields, and but they precisely give you the the components you need to to form a, a sixteen independent uh, in the, uh, independent sixteen components of this theta. Okay, so how is the how is the action after gauge fixing? So I'll just consider these images. I'll fix it uh, in a very similar way to what I did before. Lambda alpha, uh, d sorry, here. This L alpha will give rise to the p-square term in the action. I'll fix a to zero, chi to zero, and at the end, I'll get this action, right? So I have px dot, uh, uh, the kinetic term for the, for the pure spinner, p-square. This was there in the extended phase space, and now these, these are the ghosts. So this one is the twister-like ghost, scaling symmetry, and this extra word line symmetry. And the BRC charge looks like this. So if you, if you look at this, these two terms, it already looks like the, the pure spinner BRC charge. But, but there's still something missing there. Basically, what, what you can do is to use this uh, extra ghost variable to make all the space type spinners uh, invariant under scalings. So if you do these field redefinitions here, the action is completely uh, unchanged. But now we are flipping the, the ghost number of, this, of the, of the pure spinner and these uh, ghosts here. And at the end, you get this BRST charge, so lambda alpha of the alpha plus, plus this extra component. But you can think this is as a, if you analyze the cohomology of this term, it's, it's completely trivial, right? So you can uh, decouple these uh, this ghosts, omega, omega, uh, omega, omega bar, beta, gamma, as some kind of, you can use some, it's not exactly a quartet argument, but you can see that the cohomology coming from this part is trivial, and you get to the pure spinner BRST charge. Right? What I want to do now is to generalize this to the, to the word sheet. So... In order to do that, I would, I would just make a quick review of So this is the Polyakov action. Everybody knows it. Uh, the first order formulation is not, is not as common, but it's very simple to obtain. Right? So you can see here it's, it's very similar to the, to the word line action of the particle. Right? You have these two p squared terms. And, uh, and the word sheet metric enters, this, enters the action in form of these Lagrange multipliers. Right? So you were kind of uh, fit to use the same analogy that you had before for this p square uh, uh, for the p square constraints, both that are double here now, and write them down in terms of some twister-like constraint. Right? So that's what Nathan proposed. So instead of this pm gamma m lambda, you have this these constraints. So these are the uh, you can think of them as the worksheet generalization of the twister-like constraint. And by construction, if you impose h alpha and h hat alpha hat to zero, you get these two constraints, and they're exactly the, the, the generators of word line re uh, worksheet reparameterizations here. Yeah. And uh, <coughs> as I said, the metric appears only in these Lagrange multipliers. It will appear later in terms of the uh, Lagrange multipliers of the twister like constraint. So this is the action that Nathan proposed. Right, so it's a, it's a first order action. You have here px dot, as we had before, the kinetic terms for the, for the lambdas. So now we have one pure spinner for each of these constraints. So I'm making this distinction, lambda and lambda hat. You have these two terms. And these, these ones, if you do the similar shift that I made here, uh, you get to the p square in the action, so these two terms here. So they, they're just being absorbed by L alpha and L hat alpha hat. And because of the, of the, the gauge algebra, basically if you commute two of these uh, generators, you, you get another, another constraint, and this extra constraint is, in, is being implemented here by these two other Lagrange multipliers, k alpha and k hat alpha. Right? So the, the gauge fields for scaling scheme that I had before, they're just written here in a very compact notation. Basically, they are inside the, these covariant derivatives. So one immediate problem of this, of this action is that 
If you want uh, reparameterization symmetry to be redundant or to be removed by gauge for gauge transformation, uh, you cannot do it here. So uh, you have to extend it somehow. And you have also to consider the things that uh, I mentioned before for the super particle. The, the, the twister-like ghosts, they are, they, they are not uh, independent, so you have only five components, so you have to extend this phase space. And of course, you can introduce also these word line ghosts that are scalars. So this is the action, so it looks much worse, bigger, for sure. So I'm just writing here uh, this W alpha and K alpha in a more compact notation, so it's I want to try to have uh, reparameterization symmetry as explicit as I can. I have here the Lagrange multipliers for the twister-like constraints, and this is the extended action. Right? So these two terms, the first terms with B and, and B hat, they are necessary. The, the, you can think of them as imposing a zero curvature, zero curvature condition on the gauge fields, but they will be necessary later to uh, tonalize the gauge algebra and precisely because of these this terms, the gauge, the reparameterization <laughs> symmetry is a, is a redundant symmetry, right? And these other ones are just uh, an analogy that we had before for the, for the particle. So I have the kinetic term for this extra variable that satisfies this constraint, but now again, one for each uh, se sector. You have the generator of, of the word sheet, uh, this word sheet fermionic symmetry, and this last term is, is an, uh, it's a, you can think of it as a super partner of this one. So this sigma is imposing a, a zero curvature condition on this fermionic gauge field. Okay. Ah. So you can just proceed with the gauge fixing. Again, you cannot fix L alpha and L hat, L hat alpha to zero because that would imply a singular gauge fixing of the, of the worksheet metric. So you can choose this, these things instead. And they correspond exactly to E plus and E minus equals one. Right? So you can think of it as the conformal gauge. And then you can use all the other gauge symmetries uh, to fix the gauge fields for, for scaling symmetry, the, the gauge fields for the this fer, lo, local fermionic symmetry, and this uh, other gauge choice for this curve symmetry. This curve symmetry is, is a bit silly because if you, if you have a Lagrangian of this form, the I, so, oh, basically you can just make a gauge transformation of this form. Uh, epsilon ij dj of some lambda alpha, for example. And because this is antisymmetric, you have two derivatives, and this, this is a kind of trivial gauge symmetry, but you can use it to fix uh, these components. So at the end, you get this very ugly action. So these ones come from the, uh, the gauge fixing of, of Ls, L and L hat. And I told you this is equivalent to the conformal gauge. And you can see it because if you, if you, fix, if you solve the equation of motion for P, what you get is the uh, standard d, dx, d bar x term in the action. Right? And you have all these other terms. Let's, let's look at this, this, the second and third line. So this is the pure spinner kinetic term. You have this extra constraint part that I introduced. This is the, the twister-like the twister ghost, and it's... Uh, Conjugate. This one is. Uh, <coughs> this one appears as a as a kind of supersymmetric generalization of, of the symmetry that I had before, and uh, and this one is connected to this curve symmetry. Okay. Here you have the gauge field again for the scaling, the gauge field for the local symmetry, and the ghost uh, for scaling and this local fermionic symmetry. Right. And you can see that after this gauge fixing, the action splits nicely in terms of uh, left movers and right movers. Again, 
you can simplify it a, a, a lot by, by analyzing the, the action or this, this field redefinition in terms of this, this gamma, this uh, scalar ghost. Right? So it, basically, if you require that all the, the space-time spinners are invariant and the scaling symmetry, you, you, you find this uh, field redefinitions, the action will preserve its form, but the BRST charge is simplified to this one. Right? And you can use the, the again the quartet arguments to 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 say that these this lines in red they, they don't uh, contribute to the cohomology. And again, you can simplify the action a bit further. So this is the final form of the action. Basically, you see that all these extra fields they decouple. They don't they don't contribute to the cohomology. And you get at the end only this 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 these two pairs of, of space-time spinners, one for each uh, worksheet direction, let's say. And because of the constraints that you had before, so remember that theta alpha, or let's say in terms of the, the lambda gamma n gamma n pi equals zero, so it means that theta and pi only five independent components. And you had also uh, this psi and p, and they have each 11 independent components. And this one, you can see by this gauge, by, by this constraint. Right? So now, because of, of your field redefinition, this, these two fields, they have uh, ghost number zero. And more than that, you can see that these, these components, these independent components, they are complementary. So you can combine them into an uh, unconstrained uh, space-time spinner in this form. And you can see that the action is now n equals to supersymmetric. So in this sense, supersymmetry or space-time supersymmetry is an emergent feature of this, of this action. All right, so if you solve, you can write it in a more conventional form by, by uh, Vic rotating the, the worksheet coordinates, and if you solve the equation of motion for PM, the, the, the conjugate to X, this is the final form of the action, now in terms of unconstrained spinners, and the BRC charge is just this one, right? And the alpha is expressed as this. So it's basically a, a worksheet uh, generalization of, of the previous word line that we had, the word line the alpha. So this is a. So th th this action here. So it's a proposal for the underlying gauge symmetry of a uh, gauge theory of, of the pure spinner action. You see, that there's a lot of uh, extra fields, but at the end they decouple from the model. And there's a. There is now a better understanding of, of the of the worksheet reparameterization, and you, you can even. Uh, construct a model where, where the representation goals are explicitly, the, explicitly there. I can talk about it later if, if you want to know. Uh, Supersymmetry is an emergent feature, right? So it's not there in the beginning. It emerges with these ghost variables. Uh, I told you that the, this mo physical motivation for this exofermionic symmetry is lacking, but it was motivated by this super embedding formulation. So there might be something to be investigated there. And in particular, this super embedding formulation was, to, was used to demonstrate that the, the spinning particle and the, the brink charge super, uh, super particle, they are classically equivalent. So there might be some ingredient they're missing that could, in principle, connect the three, the three formulas. I think that's the, that's the main motivation. Uh, and this is related to, the, to this topic here. So what's the connection between uh, pure spinners, RNS superstring, and green short superstring? And I think this, uh, this model can, can, might have something to say about it. Uh, this, is a, this is a bit more technical. So the, the master action was, was, was built. And all these uh, pure spinner symmetries, they were taken into account. So they emerged as uh, constraints on the anti-fields. So it might be interesting to understand, uh, for example, alternative gauge fixings or what kind of model they could lead to. And in fact, this was, this was uh, Nathan's proposal. 
So he proposed in his paper that the Greenschwartz superstring can be seen as, a, as an alternative gauge fixing of this model, but it's, it's not quite it because you see that there are some, some uh, the holes that were filled later, so this, this is something to be investigated. And I mentioned here before, there is this non extended formulas where you have pure spinners plus the, the worksheet representation goes explicitly in the BRC chart, so you can, you can have, for example, the, the usual Virasoro term, C times T, but this is something that uh, I don't think it adds much. It, it depends on who is looking for it, I guess, but uh, you can have these this goals there in principle and see what are the implications in your model. So that's all. Yes, so so as I said, uh, reparameterization is now a consequence of the of the twister-like symmetry, and of course, for example, if you consider the energy momentum tensor, since this is a uh, this is contained somehow in the in the twister-like constraint, you would expect that there is some object B that satisfies this. So basically, T is as BRST exact. Right? And then you can think, OK, can I, can I have the fundamental big ghost there? And in fact, there is, there is a, basically, if you do an alternative gauge fixing, you can have a BRST charge that looks like this. Lambda alpha, D alpha plus B times phi e to the u, right? What does this mean? So this is a similar transformation of the pure spinner BRST charge plus this uh, uh, extra, how do you say, trivial pair. So have B and C as the reparameterization goes, and you have phi, and let's say phi bar, as the anti ghost as the ghost for ghost, right? So they, they should appear trivially here. So these are the ghosts for ghosts. But the point is that if you if you if you analyze the this similarity transformation, what you get at the end is a BRC charge that looks like this. plus b times phi. Something like, something like this. Uh, I don't remember exactly the form. And this b here would be this one. So it's a, uh, how can you say? It's, uh, it's the, the composite b goes that appears in this similar transformation. And in this action, you have this. So b is the fundamental big ghost and it appears there. And you can, you can extend this of to amplitudes, for example, and then you see you have picture changing and everything. In principle, you could think, okay, you have now a fundamental big ghost that will help us in the amplitude computation, for example. But the thing is, because of the, of the phi and phi bar system, you have pictures now. And the picture changing operator will involve this composite big ghost. Right? So at first, it seems that it will help you but this big ghost that's uh, kind of problematic in the pure spinner formalism, it will enter uh, from some other way, right? Picture changing operator. 